I've just traveled through the time portal. My second trip, oh good, I'm doing these in order, was just as unsettling as my first. I could feel arcs of electricity coursing through the very fiber of my body as I was propelled through time and space. As the swirling sensation stopped, I found myself face down in the sand. Slowly, I became aware of sounds in the distance. I could hear the gentle ocean waves lapping on the shore and the cry of seagulls overhead. I could feel the hot sun on my back. As I raised my head, I could see what appeared to be a winding path leading up to the steps of a magnificent Mayan temple. I know where I am. Thousands of miles from Egypt in Central America. I've been studying the perfectly preserved carving on the stelae I found along the path and identified them. This is a Mayan settlement. Considering their blood-centered customs and rituals, if this epoch is at the height of their culture, I have mixed feelings about coming face to face with a Mayan. I can't let apprehension paralyze me. I will press on. I'm able to translate only a few of the symbols on the stelae. I'll have to come back later. I wanted to explore further. Towering above me is a massive pyramid, framed against a perfect blue sky. Speaking of which, I often wonder what the difference is between a ziggurat and a pyramid is. Oh well. Its steps are clean, swept free of dust and jungle leaves just moments ago, it seems. The Maya civilization peaked in the 1200s and then mysteriously vanished. Where exactly in time am I? I'm listening among the waves of nature. Sounds for signs of life, like a crying child, voices, anything. Will I encounter the inhabitants, or will this world be as empty as Egypt? I've climbed the steps of the edge of the temple platform. I have been scanning the area. I may be in the Yucatan Peninsula, perhaps the city of Tulum. I'm remembering 10 years back, mounting the well-worn steps to Chichen Itza's astronomical observatory, hearing the echoes in his temple of warriors, and feeling a wave of humanity washing over me while excavating a sacrificial well. Today, I may find future rarities in great abundance, and signs of deeds freshly done. Back in my own time, I dug meticulously for artifacts and searched for clues that pointed to Atlantis. Here, the trail is so incredibly fresh, I'm tempted to take it for granted. I could fill a museum with what I can see just from this spot. This temple's architecture is clearly Mayan, and it reminds me of the Castillo the sacred pyramid that dominated the city of Chichen Itza. So that's what I'll call it. Castillo. Each year on the spring and fall equinox, people gather at dawn to watch the great serpent's shadow descend the steps. The similarities in construction techniques and form to Egyptian pyramids are quite obvious. This to me is a strong indication of shared knowledge. Huh. Given the time lapse from ancient Egypt to Mayan culture and the fact that there are very different constructions intended for very different purposes, I wouldn't have considered too much of a similarity myself. I've always subscribed to the pyramid belt theory that attempts to relate the existence of the pyramid building societies along the 30 degree latitude line in the Middle East, Iran, and Indian subcontinent, Egypt, North, and Central America. The progression seemed to have been towards the east, eventually jumping the Atlantic Ocean. I've maintained that it is most likely that the pyramidal structure started in Atlantis and was imitated in the surrounding lands before the destruction of Atlantis. These pyramid builders also constructed vast systems of canals, which Plato's account of Atlantis clearly describes. Look, not knocking the whole alien thing given I just traveled through time, but Plato's Atlantis, yeah, it does describe canals because it's also describing the city. All right, let's see if I can remember this properly. Plato's dialogue Timaeus introduces Atlantis as this antagonistic nation to be defeated by ancient Athens. Athens is said to be a great place. Atlantis is the antagonist. And then the dialogue, after establishing that fact, proceeds to gaze into eternity on the nature of the universe and humanity and what shape the parts of the universe are made of. And Atlantis sort of stops being relevant and the dialogue starts becoming all rather interesting, boring, wrong, and long, which is the most terrible of combinations something can have. Thankfully, the dialogue Critias continues with the juicy Atlantis parts, although the juicy bits are pretty much some rather detailed city planning concepts that at the very least could be read, if only to be put to use in some city or civilization. By the time the dialogue finally starts getting interesting and the people of Atlantis begin to fall apart, and Zeus is about to cast sharp words and lightning bolts, 
The whole point of the dialogue is supposed to be that Atlantis is ruled terribly via a monarchy, and it cannot keep its virtues as good rulers die to be replaced by idiots, no matter how well they try to put on how beautiful of a culture they have. And this is to counterpoint the philosophy ruled and philosophical ruler's ideas that Plato believed were superior to the governance of a civilization. And thus, those good qualities, in his opinion, were assigned to Athens, not Atlantis. Atlantis, as it appears here, is more likely an invention to prove an argument, or at the very least, no better than any other monarchy from any other civilization. If anything, the intent is to show much better Athens is, not Atlantis. Or, to put it another way... The first description of Atlantis in literature was from Plato in a series of discussions from his works Timaeus and Critias. According to Plato, Atlantis was a utopia that existed somewhere in the Western Ocean. It was never known whether Plato was actually describing the fabled lost continent or fabricating an elaborate concept to help prove an argument, as he was known to do. Anyway, that was way too long of a sidetrack. Let me get back to this. I was not surprised, but vindicated when orbital radar imaging revealed the presence of extensive canal systems under the forest cover of Guatemala and Belize. Analysis has shown that these systems of irrigation and drainage could have supported millions of inhabitants. I always wondered how a people who possessed neither their draft animals nor the wheel could erect such magnificent cities in the midst of an unrelenting jungle. But then I learned of the discovery of wheelage toys in Mexican digs which seemed to indicate that the wheel was once used and then somehow forgotten. It's not surprising. The existence and disappearance of advanced science and knowledge is a proven fact. Several key discoveries have fueled my long quest to find Atlantis. Modern man has found items such as a gear-driven star computer dating back to early Greece, enabling navigation by night beyond the sight of land, perhaps across the Atlantic. In the Middle East, mysterious 2,000-year-old copper vases with iron center rods set in pitch were shown to be functional batteries which may have been used to power illumination or electroplating. That sounds familiar. Didn't Mythbusters try that out once? Oh, I don't remember. An artifact in a pre-Columbian tomb was theorized to not be a depiction of some bird, but a drawing of a flying machine. I'll never forget my amazement when, at the Cario Museum, we test flew working models of gliders found in Egyptian tombs. These were not just crude attempts, but had excellent flight characteristics. And what could I think when I learnt of an intricate silver chalice found embedded in a granite boulder whose formation would have needed hundreds of thousands or even millions of years? I am sure that these cultures existed before the recognized advent of civilization. Now, with the discovery of these time gates, I can see how some of these discoveries could spread over such distant ages. I was right all along. What sweet victory! I noticed that in your euphoria, you seem to have forgot you have a wife. Not that this isn't a crazy discovery, but the only reason I haven't broken down yet and started crying about missing everyone I care about and being stranded out of time knowing that everyone I ever cared about has yet to exist is because I'm insane. It's midday, but the mixture of noise and quiet around me makes me as apprehensive as if it were midnight. As I stood gazing at the intricate stone carvings on the facade of the temple, I became aware of other sounds in the distance, strange screeches that echoed in my ears with a dim familiarity. The calls built to a cacophony of raucous shrieks, and suddenly it hit me. The far-off sounds I was hearing were the calls of monkeys and parrots. There must be a jungle nearby. I have been unable to enter the first temple. There's a strange electrical field that's preventing my access. I'm heading back down to the beach to consider a different approach. And I just had the scare of my life. As I rounded the bend, a strange being with the same dark voice that I heard in the Egyptian time suddenly formed out of the swirling sand. He threatened me and then vanished. I don't understand what it is or what it wants. Was the earth populated with these beings in the past? Could these have been the source of the mythical demons? It seems to have incredible powers. Why doesn't it just attack and finish me off? I'm finally inside the Castillo Temple. A chameleon-like creature blocked my path, but I understood its little gimmick and was able to get right past them. I'm doing pretty good. I still have all my blood. For the last few hours I've been exploring, I discovered an intriguing godhead sculpture similar to the one I encountered in Egypt. 
I haven't yet figured out its workings or its source of power. There is a huge mural calendar here and counting symbols carved on the wall. In contrast with their sophisticated written language, the Maya used only three characters to represent numbers. A shell, a dot, and a bar. Ah, this is what I was incorrectly thinking of in Egypt. They understood the concept zero and used it in their calculations, a feat matched only by the Hindus and Babylonians. Could their mathematical sophistication have led to their precise calendar? Don't knock zero, it is quite sophisticated. It's an incredibly important concept in mathematics, especially in higher level math that goes beyond the concrete into the abstract. And it's certainly important with calculus. These jungle bound people also understood the abstract concept of infinity. An amazing feat for any civilization. This is one of the reasons I long suspected a higher influence at work here. I know, right? Higher influence weed does amazing things. I've continued my exploration of the Castillo Temple and found a clay pot with several scraps of paper inside. My writing, I thought. Then I plunged my hand into the pot and pulled the paper out. It was covered with new dried blood. I stared at the paper, realization dawning on my mind that the tools on the table were actually bloodletting devices, thorn studded ropes, stingray spines, and shards of flint. The Maya nobility used these to pierce their bodies, offering their blood in exchange for rain and other gifts from the gods. I have seen the bloodletting ritual on numerous murals, whose discovery changed our views of the Maya as a peaceful race. Images of men stabbing their genitals and women drawing thorn-studded cord through their tongues. Oh my... Me. <clears throat> the king's blood was the most sacred of all. Drops were splattered onto paper, which was then burned atop a temple. It's inconceivable to me that the Maya let blood on a hundred or so important events each year. On a more scientific note, the Mayan had blood ties with peoples in Ocean Away. They shared the rare RH negative factor with the Basquez who lived across the Atlantic. This is a chilling mural. It shows a long line of terrified sacrificial victims ascending the steps of the temple. I can imagine their fear as they heard the screams of their slaughtered comrades for days on end, knowing their own horrible deaths were coming. The remains of sacrificed animals are here, as well as signs of the supreme sacrifice, human life. Victims included slaves, enemies, orphans, even women and children. It was common to tear out the victim's heart and... Nope. 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 I think I found a potential inspiration for Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. I didn't want to, though. Oh, look at the sea. It's how peaceful it is. Maybe this relaxing nature can put me at ease reading the rest of this. I know I have to. It's this journal. I should really know what I'm in for. I just don't want to. Anyway, let's get back to us. It was common. To... Oh, well, if I'm going to read it, I might as well get into it. It was common to tear out the victim's heart on a sacrificial altar. Some sacrifices were thrown into the black waters of the cenote pool in times of drought, hoping to bring the gift of rain. Other souls were tortured, flayed, mutilated, and disemboweled. The mural shows the steps of the pyramid literally running with rivers of blood. <clears throat> Excuse me. Oh, cenote. Um, those are pools of exposed groundwater, rather terrifying actually, given that underneath the pool connects to vast cave systems. You could throw bones in it all year, so obviously they'd be a hit with the Mayan locals. The Maya had no corner on cruelty. History is filled with large-scale barbaric acts performed for seemingly justifiable reasons. Humans are a worthless lot of bastards, the inhumanity to their own kind. Night is falling as I look out through the open temple door. I can see three more temples set along the plaza. It was typical of the Maya to arrange and align structures to form astronomical observatories positioned to give the viewer lines of sight for determining the solstices and equinoxes. These herald the crucial seasonal changes that are important for the crop cycle. The Anasazi Sun Watcher rock formations and the Egyptian pyramids serve similar purposes as well. 
precisely aligned sighting holes gave the Maya astronomers the ability to predict eclipses and track the path of Venus with an error of only 14 seconds a year. But why track Venus? Well, from our perspective on Earth, it is the brightest planet and, for that matter, brighter than the other stars save for our own sun. Might Venus have been the source or direction from which some cataclysms sprang? Tonight, I plan to study the sky. This evening, I had dinner of maize and squash, seasoned with a slice of hot pepper and cooked together in a beautifully painted pot. I felt a bit guilty using such exquisite Mayan vessel to prepare a meal, but I had no other utensils. Thank Kanum there were some pots available. For dessert, I drank a bowl of frothy Mayan chocolate. I couldn't help it. Hunger and curiosity got the best of me. I can attest that this is not the typical brew. It's bittersweet and reminiscent of exotic flowers. I can see why it was so popular. A long night of observing the planets and stars has left me reeling disbelief. If my celestial calculations are remotely correct, I've traveled back in time over eight centuries. It's June, near the summer solstice, around the year 1135 AD. It was a perfect night for observation, clear, no moon, and incredibly dark. Also, I presume light pollution wouldn't be a thing for a considerable number of centuries. I am so sleepy that I'm starting to doze off in mid-sentence. Last night, I fell asleep on the cool beach. <sighs> Instead of pleasant dreams of a tropical paradise, I had a nightmare. Undoubtedly brought on by the impressions from the sacrifice mural. I dreamt I was standing beside the main ball court at Chichen Itza when suddenly dozens of priests came rushing towards me across the plaza. Before I could move, the priests were upon me. They bound my arms, then hoisted me into the air and carried me towards the temple of the warriors. I could smell their sweat and the stench of blood. Their fingers dug into my arms and legs as they dragged me up the temple steps. At the top, they threw me down on the sacrificial altar. The slab was slippery with the blood of a recent victim. The high priest was poised above me, wielding a carved jade knife. Hands were on my naked chest, pulling my flesh taut. The high priest plunged the knife downwards. I could feel the blade split my breastplate, hear the sound of my bones cracking open. I screamed in agony as he thrust his hands deep into my gaping chest. I don't know how I was still conscious, but I watched him as he ripped out my still beating heart and held it above my body and... Don't you wish you never saw the second Indiana Jones movie? Then you wouldn't have had such a terrible dream. And more importantly, I wouldn't have had to read about it. And held it high above my body. He placed it in a waiting vessel as a sacrifice to their gods. I woke up screaming and shaking with fear. Soaked in sweat and warm seawater from the rising tide. My stomach was churning. Perhaps a nightmare was brought on by what I ate. Or a scrape from a thorn. Or some hallucinogenic plant. Nevertheless, I'll proceed very carefully from now on. I've tried to enter the other three temples facing the plaza, but the doors are jammed tight. There must be some way to access them. Is there some sort of time-based lock at work? I will return to the Castillo, where I found that amazing godhead, and study the calendar. I have spent the last day studying Maya calendar hieroglyphics, amazed at their knowledge of the patterns of time. The Maya believe life to be a repeating cycle. I found the two calendars inscribed side by side on the wall. As near as I can figure, the first is their sacred calendar, the Zolkan. The second is the Hob, based on the solar year consisting of 18 months of 20 days, each plus 5 unlucky days. The total of 365 days is as accurate as our modern calendars. Both the Maya and the Egyptians calculated the exact number of days in the solar year, but even more amazing than this astromathematical feat is that they both started their new year on February 26 which is more likely to be a shared tradition. Is this true? I never heard that mentioned anywhere before. From what I've been able to translate, the two calendar cycles were used together like hugged wheels. Wheels again. Is it likely that a people who supposedly did not use the wheel for transportation would use wheels and the gear principle in their calendars? Perhaps wheels may simply have just been impractical for jungle transportation. Here is a reference to a third calendar system called the Long Count. It records the beginning and ending of the cycles of time. The current cycle began on 3114 BC. According to this calendar, this world will cease to exist on December 23rd, 2012. Oh, come on. Maya believed life is a repeating cycle. 
You said that already. The long count was simply going to get incremented. I wonder if I'm meeting the professor out of order of his timeline that I know him in. It's already 2018. The world isn't ending. The calendar just needed to be updated. Although I doubt the Mayans would have expected themselves to live that long. But <laughs> with the whole murdering each other thing now going on. What cycle are they measuring? Is it the return of a swarm of asteroids? The reversal of the magnetic pulse? Some oscillation of global temperature. The cycle is so long. Was it passed down through many generations? Or was the information obtained from some external source? Longing for daylight, I was studying the inscriptions on the stelae to gain some insight on entering the other temples. And once again, the strange being appeared. This time it formed out of an electrified haze and stood there, taunting and intimidating me. It seems to know me. Is it my imagination? Well, I'm having the same thing, so whatever it is, it's very much real. Are these apparitions different individuals, or could this one be following me through the time gate? The plaza is eerily quiet without people. Flames still burn on torches, and the cooking pots are still warm as if the people were preparing for dinner. Wherever the Maya went, they left within a day or two ago. I must have been wrong initially. The time gate isn't linked relatively otherwise. I would have been very late to these cultures. It must be sending me right after the civilization left. And given I'm not running into Alex, perhaps to prevent timeline tricks, the time gate sends me to right after he left. Maybe it's trying to preserve some form of linearity. Anyway, I'll stop trying to understand stuff I don't understand. As I explore, I see the likeness of the jaguar everywhere, in statues, wall murals, hieroglyphics, and carvings. Ceramics and metals were worked into jaguar images, and precious jade carved into its likeness. There was even a religious order, the jaguar priests, devoted to this stealthy cat. I've seen several of these animals prowling the fringes of the plaza, undoubtedly made bold by the absence of people. I must admit, they instill a religious fervor in me as well. Everywhere, I see evidence of a sudden departure. What momentous event could have caused the literal evacuation of the city? The Maya never just built buildings. Their edifices were works of art. Mayan architecture was as diverse as their other crafts, differing in style from one city-state to the next, yet united everywhere in its magnificence. On one of my grants, Professor Yun and I traveled to Kaba where we explored the temple of the masks, adorned with the faces of the rain god Chak. At Tikal, we stood gazing up in awe at the temple of the giant jaguar, with its enormous roof comb of wood and stone. From there, we went on to Copen and Uxmal, always searching for links among ancient cultures. I never imagined I would have a chance like this. I'm inside a small temple, painted in vivid Maya blue, made from a mixture of indigo and clay. There is a circular carving of a monkey with a hole in the center, as if something might come out of it, or go into it. Perhaps a quick-thinking looter left with a prize. Everywhere I look, I see flawless Maya pottery, sculpture, featherwork, and paintings. There's a wealth of ceremonial knives and idols carved from jade. Echoing the Mayan contrast of beauty and gore, next to these beautiful items is the shriveled head of a monkey. I stumbled upon what appeared to be a child's game. Lodged in it was a gemstone of striking beauty. I was eventually able to free the stone by outwitting a spider. I'm not sure I could do it again. Okay, that's one clever spider. Now that I'm holding the stone, I have no idea what to do with it. My instincts were right. I just encountered the vision of a Mayan priest. Oh, not another one. Recounting the creation myths of his people, or are they really myths? What form of magic or technology is this? How did the Mayans engineer this recording? Strangely, I was able to understand his language. The priest spoke of a gift from the gods received through blood. These myths support my theories and Lara's findings of genetic influence. This is an historical gold mine. I must find a way to return here with a research team and document everything. I don't know, Alex. Some sort of deep time research unit would be very dangerous indeed to history. Who knows how much I messed up the future just bumbling around Egypt so far. But why this elaborate cloaking of information? What are they protecting with these poetic truths? Could it be another pod? Similar to the Egyptian one. 
The skull-studded temple remains an enigma. I discovered a second crystal in the jaw of a skull. I tried to pry it loose or even shatter it, but nothing worked. In frustration, I tried to rebuild the skeleton. <laughs> Why not? Messy business. It's one thing to handle fossilized bones. But these are from a recent sacrifice. For my perseverance, I have been rewarded with another priest encounter. Can't tell if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I found a page torn from a painted codex book. Like the other few books I've seen, it's made from strips of soaked fig bark, pummeled and coated with a thin layer of white paint, and folded like a fan. If only that fanatical Spanish priest, Diego de Lenda, had not destroyed these irreplaceable books during a single night in the 16th century. We would have deciphered more of the Maya's unique written language and had more of it to study. Unfortunately, there are only four known codices in existence. I hope to find several complete books to take with me. I believe their translations would reveal links to other civilizations, including a concrete link to Atlantis. At least I'm taking the page with me. When I return to the 20th century, this will serve as irrefutable proof of my journey to this ancient world, assuming I do return. I'm not sure you can take the books with you. If they were destroyed, and you take them with you, then they wouldn't be destroyed, negating the reason for you to take them with you in the first place. Your timeline disintegrates. What volumes of recorded knowledge have been lost? The literal tip of the iceberg surfaced in a map whose original version came from ancient libraries and depicted accurate coastlines of continents, which would not be discovered for hundreds of years. Amazing enough, but startling when it was found that the coastline of Antarctica, including the part below the glacial ice, was correctly depicted. Why doesn't he stop? This ethereal creature baffles me. This time I just heard his voice mocking me. I've tried to engage him or it in conversation, but my attempts have so far been futile. I may be wrong in thinking him harmless. He could easily misdirect me. I have one more temple on the plaza to examine before sunset. It's marked by the jaguar, the Mayan symbol of power. Every time I enter a temple, I feel like I'm being watched. I'm here during the very era of incredibly bloody customs, and my body is literally apprehensive all on its own. What would happen if I stumble upon some ritual in progress? There is evidence of the Maya's metallurgy skills in this temple. These people considered gold to be a tears of the sun and silver to be tears of the moon. They used gold and silver not as money, nor stores of value, but for beauty. I remember how my mind was overwhelmed when I read accounts of Spanish conquistadors finding trees of gold with silver birds perched on their branches. This forge looks fresh used. The mold has been prepared and awaits the molten metal. I can't resist the calling of the craft. Sometimes the ornate appearance of an object may mask its true purpose as an instrument. This statue is almost identical to the one I saw at Chichen Itza. The small shallow bowl at the navel of the reclining idol may have been filled with liquid mercury to serve as a perfect celestial alignment mirror or as a holder for a magnetic lodestone compass point. In the case of this idol, I suspect it plays a sacrificial role. I found a passageway below this temple, festooned with a large feathered headdress. I suspect the feathers came from the brilliant gold and green tail feathers of the Quetzal bird. I intend to explore tomorrow. Now I must go back into the sunlight, drink, eat, and rest. I hope I don't have any more nightmares. This morning I encountered another impasse. There's a rope bridge across a cenote sacrificial pool, but the support ropes seem to have lost their tension over time. The cenote pool was considered the gateway to the underworld. I don't want to try to slide down the slackened bridge and find myself swimming among who knows what. Wait, whoa, 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 hold on. What am I thinking? There were people here just days ago. The bridge isn't loose from age. I was right. I'm across the bridge, on a path that leads to the jungle. I can't help staring off into the vine-clad trees, wondering why the Maya might abandon their city for the danger of the jungle. It storms every few days at this time of year, and any footprints, however numerous, would have been washed away. I have to be careful. The jungle floor is slippery. I can hear the calls of birds and the screeches of monkeys from every direction. As I travel through this ancient world, the question haunts my steps. Why did the Maya civilization rise so rapidly to such phenomenal heights? 
only to suddenly decline and vanish. Why did a people so advanced in science, architecture, astronomy, and calendars, mathematics, writing, and religion suddenly abandon the greatest cities in the Americas? Certainly many more must have perished in the harsh and impenetrable rainforest. Eh. Personally, if that was a choice between that and very probably being someone's sacrifice for the day, I'd say the call of the wild and jungle would look to have better odds by comparison. My theories have accounted for the spectacular rise of the enigmatic civilizations, the obvious link of shared knowledge between the Egyptians and Maya cultures. The pre-classic Mayan era was marked by an unsophisticated agrarian society of loosened tribal factions. Then suddenly rose the exalted Ahal rank. From this ruling class of priests and kings, the Maya ascent quickly accelerated. Clearly such a leap forward did not happen by chance not by the slow process of cultural evolution or even the influence of Egyptians. The Mayan, Egyptian, and Anasazi civilizations all shared this rapid ascent and decline. It's unlikely that the Maya all went towards the sea. There's historical evidence of these people abandoning one city and starting another. Professor Parascandolo's theory was that their farmland would be exhausted, forcing a resettlement. Later discoveries of submerged city ruins provide another motivation, the rising sea level which may have occurred at widely spaced intervals, would have made it imperative to move. Perhaps this was the source of their preoccupation with precise astronomical observations. They may have been trying to predict these cataclysmic events. As I hoped, and well beyond my expectation, there had to have been an outside catalyst for both civilizations, some fountainhead of enlightenment that nurtured their rise. I believe the link to be the long-lost Atlantis, even though I assume it existed. There are still unanswered questions. How was the Atlantean knowledge transferred? Even if the Atlanteans had arrived as gods bearing great technological gifts and apparently no prime directive, how would this information be disseminated? And what effects, other than technological, did it have on these cultures? Is it possible the answer lies in the Mayan obsession with extraterrestrial events? They track the planets from dozens of observatories, build temples and cities in alignment with the stars, and schedule their lives around a celestial calendar. Could it be that the Maya reached up for the stars? Because the dawn of their great civilization, some force from the stars, had reached down to them? I personally look to the stars as a genuine human wonder and awe. I'm fishing for obvious similarities among cultures, but the similarities may have been less evident, yet more profound than is outwardly visible. There's still one thing baffling me. The sudden decline, the loss of knowledge, the vanished people. What happened? Where did everyone go? Hmm, where did everyone go? <laughs> Maybe they went with the aliens. Maybe they went with the aliens. Maybe they went with the aliens. If I'm not careful, I'm going to fill my journal with more questions and answers. I passed a large stone idol in my travel through the jungle. From what I've been able to ascertain, there are two temples in the jungle. I have no idea how to enter the first one, and I was unable to access the second temple until I took a survey trip back to the plaza. This temple is larger than the others, and its main motif is the lizard. I was almost knocked backwards with surprise. A crystalline pyramid has just formed before my very eyes. After recovering my wits, I began studying its meaning. It's reminiscent of the Maya creation myths I've studied. The Maya believed the world was made up of three layers, 13 tiers of heaven, a middle world of earth, and nine tiers of the dark underworld. The Maya conceived of the human plane as a sacred plane, a region floating on the back of a crocodile or a turtle in the primordial sea. Oh my goddess, they conceived of disc world centuries before its time. The four directions of the compass served as the basic grid for both their culture and the surface of the world and were represented by their own special tree symbol, animal, color, and god. In the center, they envisioned a world tree with roots in the underworld, its trunk in the middle world, and branches reaching to the heaven. There are skulls here, of course. I'm beginning to see their purpose. Perhaps this is my entry to the underworld. Hmm. These face drawings are numbered. Perhaps I'll need that to decipher something later. I found another genetic pod. It has a precious jade lizard emblem on the exterior. A voice spoke to me from some projected image, and from it, I understood more of the use and power of these pods. If, as I now suspect, they contain genetic material, I'm holding a treasure beyond estimation. But why are these incredibly valuable pods still here, when the people are not? If the Atlanteans use the time gates, where are the Atlanteans now? If I wait long enough, will I see one on some research expedition? 
Most of all, now I can't wait to return to my own time with the prize in hand. If I could just figure out how to leave this world, there must be another time portal. It's only logical. I've discovered something rather strange about the final temple. I had given up finding a way to enter it, so I left to explore another temple. When I returned, I found a crystal embedded in the circular disc on the door. The markings on this wall look familiar. Where have I seen them before? I found the time portal.